a special presentation of LOBF with archaeologists Dr. Lawrence Garrity and Dr. Doug Clark, Excavating the Bible. Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, What Archaeology Can Teach Us. This program is dedicated to exploring what Middle Eastern archaeology can teach us about the Bible. I'm Doug Clark, uh, director of the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University in Riverside, California. And to help us explore biblical connections with Herbert Atarouz in uh, South Central Jordan is Dr. Chung Ho Ji, who is the director of the project and is in the School of Education at La Sierra University. Mm -hmm. My co-host is Dr. Larry Garrity, former president of La Sierra University, founding director of the Madaba Plains mm -hmm. Project. Uh, as we talk about uh, this site, we want to talk about biblical connections with the site. We want to talk about archaeology and what we can learn from it. And so I think maybe to start with, we ought to find out what this site is. I've given this Arabic name, and that's what it is. That's not the biblical name, though. Close, but not that's the biblical right. name. Uh -huh. So let's think about the site, its location. Mm -hmm. And if you want to, we can uh, come over here to the map, uh, and you can tell us where we are. You see on this modern Jordanian map, Atarus, it is a site in central Jordan, very close to Dead Sea. Actually, if you're standing at the site, you can see Dead Sea with Jerusalem and Jericho, not far away. So it is a pretty strategically located, but also kind of in some ways remote places. But it is the place that is mentioned in the Bible in the name of Ataroth. So most scholars, they agree with us that this is the biblical Ataroth. And also, this is the site that is mentioned in ancient inscription. So, Ataruz is the modern Arabic, but it has captured and kept most of the exactly. uh, ancient names. That's right. This kind of a case is probably not, you know, that common. But uh, this has a kind of a long history, and people have kept this name for, e for thousands of years. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Biblical connections. That's the title of this particular episode. So, biblical connections with Ataruz. Yeah, uh, this name appears first in the book of Numbers. And then this is the place that is kind of cited as one of the places given to the Gedites and Reubenites. And then it appears um, as a kind of the place for the sheep and cattle. In other words, Gedites and Reubenites were very much into this kind of a cattle grazing and then kind of in some ways nomadic, but also sedentarized life as well. And that's mm -hmm. going to factor into are thinking about a, a major inscription with the sheep and so on. That so is right. You, yeah. you, it was important to mention that because that is <laughs> the text is very clear about that, the sheep and the cattle. That's and right. And that connects mm -hmm. so well with this other text. That That's right. As compared to the Madaba Plains, uh, this area is called currently Jabal Hamida. It's very arid and dry. And then it is difficult to have a kind of a major you know, grain fields. So people still rely on animals in this area. Right, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. right. Okay, a war. I mean, lots of wars in the Bible. Uh -huh. What war are we talking about that pulls Atarot or Ataruz into? Mm -hmm. uh, in the Second Kings, the book of Second Kings, there is a very famous war that uh, rarely it happens, but uh, this particular case it happened. The northern and southern kingdom, the Judah and Israel, they teamed up together and they decided to go war against their common enemy, who was the Moabite. So in the second kings of you know, chapter three, uh, these two kingdoms, they made up the alliance army and they go all the way down to the Dead Sea and then go up to the north and then make a surprise attack on the Moabites. Now they collected someone else. There was another king that they brought with them, which is also an unusual alliance. That so you have Judah and Israel and then the Edomites are somehow That's right. sucked They're all into together. this <laughs> from the south and then they come up to the north. I think the reason was at that time the Moabite, their power and military force began to grow. And then the neighboring you know, kingdoms or the chiefdoms begin to feel kind of uh, threatened by this growing power. So they may decide to together to quell you know, this growing power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and then so we have an account and it takes up all of chapter three mm -hmm. of Second Kings. Um, the attack, there are, there's a, they're running out of water, uh, yeah. there's mm -hmm. a miracle of the water, mm -hmm. there's a ruse set up by the water, it kind of looks like blood from one side right. as the <laughs> sun is rising. Yeah, on top of that, uh, there's an interesting story that uh, about uh, when they 
seized the capital city, the Moabite king decided to sacrifice his son. And that happened at the right top of the gate, and then people got so afraid of this, and then they decided to retreat. So that mm -hmm. was the end of the war. So the alliance army, they never, in other words, they couldn't prevail the Moabites. Right. But uh, there is some kind of a, uh, I if you travel this area, you will see really there is no water. It's very difficult to collect you know, water, unlike the, the western side of the Jordanian, I mean, the western side of the Jordan River. And then, so you will see hundreds of hundreds of cisterns in this area. So the making the war uh, in a kind of a large scale, in a, in a long mm -hmm. period of time, mm -hmm. was a major challenge for anyone. And the Moabite knew more than anyone else about the difficulties that the enemy is going to face. Mm -hmm. Now there's some indication, and I see you've put the plateau of Karak on here. Mm -hmm. um, and, I and many people would say that the, the, the city where this ended up, where the sacrifice of the eldest mm -hmm. son was made, was at Karak. Is that, is that correct? Or is well, that, uh, that is not really, you know, that, no one really knows, right? Okay. Because uh, between uh, here, we probably need to introduce the stele called the Mesha inscription. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the most famous inscriptions, a stele that is found in the Levant area. What's a stele? Many of our viewers may not know what a stele kind is. Of inscribed mm -hmm. stones. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then especially this Mesha inscription is recording how the king of the Moabite, whose name is Mesha, waged war against the Israelites and how got the victory over them and prevailed, you know, those. And then in this, you know, inscription, um, they, he really kind of make a huge kind of stories out of it, saying that how he uh, captured, you know, a dozen of cities from the Israelite kingdom. Mm -hmm. And then what he did, you know, to the people used to live in those, you know, cities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then one of those cities, the place that we're excavating at Teruth. And uh, what is described in the inscription amazingly coming in kind of a together with the archaeological evidence that we're excavating. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, the war story in the second book of the second, I mean, second, you know, books of the kings, and then Mesha inscription steal a story. Which one comes first, mm -hmm. which comes you know, next? It is very difficult, you know, so one of the many scenarios, of course, you know, going on about that. Uh, you know, it's really unusual, isn't it, to have an experience that is described from the Bible's point of view as well as from an archaeological inscription that's been found. Mm -hmm. There are a few other times in Bible history where that's the case, but it's interesting how we put those two accounts together, one from the Bible and one from the Moabites itself, and come up with the story of what happened. That's right. Mm -hmm. At least there seems to be some overlapping. Some people yeah. would argue that they are, and I think you talked about whether one is before the other that or after right. the other. Yeah. So there is debate about it, but, but it is really very nice to have mm -hmm. parallel accounts, at least of these encounters. Right, mm -hmm. right, right, right. So right. one was that uh, Israelite <coughs> kind of version, the other one is a Moabite version of the Prophet's story. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And, and people can find the copy of the, call it the Moabite stone or the Mesha stela or the Mesha inscription, Mesha being the king. Um, they can find that anywhere. I mean, it's published. You can yeah. find right. it online yeah. easily. And there are a number of, I think, some very interesting things noted, like um, the language is very much the same as in the Bible. Um, mm -hmm. We did not behave as God asked us to, so mm -hmm. God raised up an enemy. Well, it's the same with Mesha. Uh, Mesha right. says we did not believe, uh, we did not, not behave as mm -hmm. Chemosh, our God, mm -hmm. wanted us to, so raised up the Israelites. So mm -hmm. this language is, uh, is so similar too. <laughs> that is right. The, 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 if you win the war, that is the victory of God. That's right. That's right. That <laughs> That's is, right. If you defeat it, that is the defeat of their God. So mm -hmm. it's very much you know, interwoven you know, as we read in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the sacrifice of the whole population, that happens two times in mm -hmm. the Mesha Stila, um, where um, to, to demonstrate his honoring of mm -hmm. Chemosh, the, the mm -hmm. Moabite god, he puts everybody in what we would call biblically the ban. Uh, everybody's <laughs> killed. Everybody's mm -hmm. destroyed. That's it's right. a sacrifice. It's a, it's a whole burnt offering. That's right. And so we have that in the Mesha inscription, which is really, I think, very That's interesting. That's right. You, you said that two places mentioned in the Mesha inscription has that kind of, uh, you know, things happen. 
one of them is Atarath. Mm -hmm. So if you read the Mesha inscription, you will see kind of five lines of story about the city. He said that this city belonged to the Gedites forever. Mm -hmm. And then he made a war against the city, and then he conquered, and he cleansed the city, which means, as mm -hmm. you said, mm -hmm. killed everyone. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that actual story implies that there was some kind of a major destruction took place. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, he said that the he uh, took some kind of a you know, you know, thing called Dawood, you know, some kind of a cultic objects. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly what that mm -hmm. is. He dragged it to the place called the Kariyat. A sort of kind of a gesture, the mm -hmm. evidence that his victory. And then he moved to new groups of people who called Sharonites and the Hellenites. So this, you know, story indicates that there was some kind of cultic importance mm -hmm. embedded in the city because the king does not just kill the people you know, in ordinary cities. Right. So there was some religious importance embedded in the city. On top of that, he evidenced that uh, he took something you know, from mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. as the kind of a, the gift, as a kind of a contribution, you know, kind of offering to their god, Kamosh. Mm -hmm. So by reading the Mesha inscription itself, we could imagine that something significant embedded and buried in the Ataroth, and that has to do with religion. That's all a setup to say what you found, right? Yeah, it is, <laughs> it is. <laughs> I mean, it and is. it's not just uh, looking at it from the past. You are actually talking about it, how we would imagine we would mm -hmm. find something there that is religious that or is cultic. Right. That's the language mm -hmm. archaeologists use. Mm -hmm. So um, we would expect that. We would anticipate that even That's before right. beginning. Mm -hmm. But now you have the demonstration and the proof that that is the case. So what did you find? That's the exciting part. Did well, it relate to the biblical story and to the Misha Stila? Can you connect them? I think, uh, you know, we need to often be very careful to connect textual evidence with archaeological right. evidence right. because archaeology itself is a scientific endeavor, but also it has a room that mm -hmm. we need to interpret, you know, mm -hmm. the findings. Uh, so, a as I said, that uh, in the Mesha inscription implies there was a major destruction, mm -hmm. some kind of a massacre took place. Mm -hmm. So it's naturally when you're excavating kind of a place that is connected with that kind of story, you're looking for destruction layer. Mm -hmm. And then that's exactly what is mm -hmm. I'm finding in the Ataruth. And then not just the destruction itself, in terms of pottery chronology and also the stratigraphy, that well aligns with this time that the Mesh inscription is mm -hmm. focusing on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is not really proving kind of the biblical story, but this is kind of providing context and then empirical data that uh, the historical, like a textual evidence Mesh inscription can tell us something really historical and significant mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now let's look here. Uh, now we have a picture of the mm -hmm. Mesha Stila. And maybe you want to just say something about it, the size of it, and incidentally, the dating. We haven't really talked about right, that. Ninth right. century, but what general dates are giving to that? That's Mesh. right. Uh, Mesh inscription, actually, there's a very interesting story behind the discovery of this mm -hmm. inscription. <laughs> According, it was about 1870 that the Europeans began to hear about kind of a standing stone with inscription mm -hmm. in the city called the Dibon. Dibon mm -hmm. was the capital city of the Moabite mm -hmm. kingdom. So they were interested to go and then find, but when uh, that thing happened, that the Beni Hamida, who was the local tribe, right. they waged war against the Ottoman Empire, and they got defeated, and they got angry at that. <laughs> and then the Ottoman Empire, when they heard that the Europeans were looking for this particular important you know, sila, they gave a kind of pressure on the beach of Belham, um, Beni Hamida to release and give it to the German, you know, the travelers. Mm -hmm. And then when they find out that they really that's coming from the Ottoman Empire, they got so upset, they broke it to pieces and then, you know, send it to all kind of a clans and the families in the, you know, the tribe. So it took quite for some time for this, you know, German, you know, archaeologists, they bring those, you know, pieces together and then they, you know, put together and then they read it. But Fortunately, before that thing happened, they actually uh, made a copy of the, all the inscriptions on the writings on the inscriptions. Mm -hmm. So even though the collected pieces was not complete as you know, the original one, but they actually could together and then compare that with the, uh, the 
copy the they made, so they could, you know, make a, and read the stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. complete the descriptions. Mm -hmm. Now, one, one more note. Before the 1870s, when the French and the Germans and the British were all interested in this, mm -hmm. it was a medical missionary, German mm -hmm. by the name of Klein, mm -hmm. A.F. Klein, mm -hmm. or F.A., anyway, mm -hmm. uh, Klein. Mm -hmm a medical missionary, one of maybe a handful of people in the Transjordan at the time. It was, it was just too dangerous of a place to be. Is, but he is. was respected mm -hmm. and he was welcomed into the community because he was a medical missionary. Uh -huh. That yeah. means something to uh, Adventists as we think about our So heritage. the inscription that they actually found is 19th century you know, BC story is recorded. And mm -hmm. then the King Mesha is 19th century kind of a BC you know, history. 9th century? 9th century. Ninth century. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So around what, 850, 830? Is that kind of the general dating that's given? That is right. Exactly, we don't know, but the most uh, reasonable kind of a guess, or the sort of kind of a majority view is 845 or 850 BC, okay. so really at the middle of the 9th century. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Now there's another inscription, and even on the slide that we have here, the, the DWD on mm -hmm. the left side of your mm -hmm. column here. That's right. Um, there is another inscription from about the same time from mm -hmm. Tel Dan in that the north right. mm -hmm. that also has DWD, mm -hmm. but it also has in front of it Beit, so Beit David, mm -hmm. the house of David, the dynasty mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. uh, David. That's right. And they come from about the same time? So Probably, that is right. <laughs> it, it, I think maybe at best about 20, 30 years apart. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So if this historic dating 900, I mean 845 or 850 is correct, I think a tell that inscription is about 825 or mm -hmm. 20, mm -hmm. so about 30, 40 year difference mm -hmm. is maximum. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're really talking about the same you know, concurrent kind of a period, and then Dawood, this name appeared on both inscriptions. Mm -hmm. so he's mm -hmm. using the Arabic. Right, got the right. Dawood, Dawood. <laughs> David, the Hebrew. Yeah. David is, the, is yeah. the English one. So could this be referring somehow to the uh, Israelite king, David, or not? There has been some opinions about you know mm -hmm. that if really DWD or the wood it really represents the David, mm -hmm. you know, that means there is some kind of a cultic or some kind of a memorial, mm -hmm. you know, uh, stuff was existing good. in mm -hmm. the Herbert Atta Ruth. to celebrate that lineage. To that celebrate is that right. Dynasty. That is right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but you know, in Tel Dan case, you know, of course that the kingdom of Israel. And yep. then House of David, Beit Israel, yeah, that's Beit right, appear Israel. side by side. So uh, the scholars, you know, kind of take that as kind of a sudden part of the Israelite, you know, the people. Mm -hmm. uh, it is really tricky, you know, in this case, <laughs> because it, later we'll talk about the historical background of the Ataruth. Ataruth really seems to be more close to the northern kingdom of Israel, mm -hmm. not a Judah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then pottery assemblage, and then historical background, the measure inscription clearly indicate that it has a lot of affinities with the northern part of the Israelite people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if there is something related to King David in Atteruth, what does that really imply? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, David was not a favorite in the northern <laughs> That is right. So <laughs> it's just kind of e Even though until then, <laughs> He is mentioned, right, uh, and that's the northern kingdom, but he was mentioned by the enemies, right? right? That, that is right. right. In yeah. fact, there's good news and bad news in this. <laughs> uh, when, when, when biblical names show up, uh, it's good news. We celebrate right. them, but they're almost always the loser in right. some kind of battle. Yes. Right. And they're put together in the Dan inscription. You know, right. Bait, or the house of Israel, yeah. and right. then the house of, of, of David. Uh, of David. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that makes for an interesting sort now, of Now, Dr. G, you also found an inscription are you willing to talk about that? That is a really <laughs> exciting discovery. It was made only about four years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is the clearly Moabite you know, inscription. Mm -hmm. In other mm -hmm. words, so here comes kind of complexity involves. You know, if the, as Mesha inscription claims, there was a Gedais, was some kind of a religious installations or kind of a cultic building existing mm -hmm. at Ruth, why we have this Moabite inscription mm -hmm. in the context, something to do with mm -hmm. the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Actually, it, it is surprisingly clear in terms of stratigraphy. Temple has a multiple periods, and then this measure, uh, this Moabite inscription coming from the last stage of the temple, you know, mm -hmm. use, 
And then between those, there is a thick layer of ashes, which means destruction mm -hmm. took place. Mm -hmm. So the sanctity of the kind of a cultic place doesn't really disappear because, uh, just because the uh, place changed from one, person, one people to another. In other mm -hmm. words, Moabites, even though they cleansed the city, they may still saw the city as kind of a holy place, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. something that they continued, you know, their religious or cultic, you know, kind of involvement. It, it seems like that happens regularly in antiquity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A place becomes holy, however it started, mm -hmm. and whoever's living there, there seems to be a tradition that you build, uh, whether it's been destroyed or not, you build a holy place over it. That, mm -hmm. That's a fairly strong tradition that one, one finds archaeologically. That's right. Right. So the sense of place as sacred mm -hmm. is, is very strong and runs across tribal, sometimes even national lines. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. More interestingly, this Moabite inscription that you just mentioned from Herbert at Toulouse was only about as high as this, about one meter. You know, mm -hmm. um, it was found right in front of altar. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, with a sort of kind of stone incense burner next to it. Mm -hmm. And then the direction is interesting because the Ataruth temple is toward northwest. Mm -hmm. But this particular altar is toward southeast, more or less like a capital city of the Diban direction. Mm -hmm. And then this inscription, you know, the kind of a, the column, stone column, was standing right in front of the altar. Mm -hmm. So. It's, uh, and then there is a kind of a, you know, about five lines of the inscriptions and the writing itself is late 19th century BC. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. uh, pottery and the stereography indicates that it was post destruction, which is, as I said, that the, if this is really connected with the inscriptions, it is about 840, 845 you know, BC. Mm -hmm. And then this inscription comes right above the destruction layer mm -hmm. and then writing paleographically also, it's late 9th century, at best early 8th century. Mm -hmm. So Chris Ralston is actually studying the inscriptions with you know, two or three other paleographers. Mm -hmm. And then it is about offering cultic, you know, kind of mm -hmm. a contribution to the temple. Uh, it, it is, according to them, is very difficult to you know, interpret and translate. Mm -hmm. So they are working together to inter, uh, translate the languages, but it will be important, not just in terms of the language purpose, but also indicates that what kind of uh, really offerings people mm -hmm. made to the temple, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then how you know, that has been recorded in the temple. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you bring something substantial, significant to the temple, temple actually commemorated that in mm -hmm. somewhere in the temple since to me. Mm -hmm. And in another edition of Excavating the Bible, we will get more into the religious. And That's right. The, we we got like, get locked into texts. Right. And, uh, <laughs> Dr. Garrity, that was, has been a subject for him yes, in right. his dissertation, too. A couple things then about, um, uh, about Ataruz and maybe something about the uh, cultic structures here. We've talked about some biblical connections. Mm -hmm. We've certainly talked about uh, connections with the Moabite stone, the Mesha mm -hmm. Stila, which is located now in the Louvre in, in Paris. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's in a room all by itself, <laughs> and it's just spectacular to yes. think about it. In fact, I think it may still be the largest monumental inscription from um, Jordan, maybe Palestine, Israel. That's too. right, that right. is the case. Very important here. inscription. Yes. And as you say, if tourists <laughs> want to visit it, they can go to the Louvre in France to see it. But it's exciting to know that uh, Dr. G is excavating in the area that's talked about in this inscription. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so what you're talking about is a tour to Paris and then there you go. Right. Okay. That's right. So <laughs> make a trip to Madaba. <laughs> right. The museum right. as well that's because right. the inscription is that's right. Right. That's right. 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 Yeah. So, uh -huh. Now, anything else you want to say about the site in general? Um, uh, again, we will be coming back to the mm -hmm. religious part, but do you want to say anything about the site in general? Uh, it is not just the uh, Iron Age or the biblical kind of Old Testament period. The reason that I'm working on is the Jabal Hamida. Uh, from the New Testament's perspective, it's also a very significant and an important area because this was the borderline. We are talking here about the Northern Kingdom of Israel and the Moabite. That you know, implies this is a border zone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if that is the case in, let's say, 908th centuries BC, that was all still the case in the first, second, and BC, and then first century AD. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, this is the place that uh, the Herodian and Hesmonian kingdom from the you know, west, and then Nabataeans 
who replaced Moabites coming from the south, they clashed along this area. Mm -hmm. More interestingly, this is the place that called Macarius is right nearby my site. And then this is the place that uh, his Jewish historian Josephus says John the Baptist mm -hmm. was beheaded. Mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. interesting enough, this is the place that King Herod's wife, who used to be the princess from the Nabataean kingdom, decided to run away to her father because she got so angry at her husband going to marry Herodia. Mm -hmm. So from this place, he contacted uh, her generals from the, his, I mean, her father's you know, uh, kingdom, and then she ran away in the night with their help. Mm -hmm. So there is some kind of a New Testament histories and stories involved. And then this reason is really many of those military forts and then evidence from both sides, and that it helps us to understand yeah, the exactly. testimony as well. So the, so the very <coughs> site where John the Baptist's head was brought on a platter, mm -hmm. uh, we call it Macarius, yeah. where Herod mm -hmm. was, was, uh, had, had his fortress, is within sight of Atarus, the, the site that you've been excavating, is that right? No, it, or almost. kind of just over the hill. Just over the hill. about uh, one mile, one and a half miles right. away. But right. uh, my own site includes interesting installations like a mikveh, the Jewish ritual. Okay, bath. right. Mm -hmm. And then also the road that was connecting, you know, outside to Mercarius, especially mm -hmm. major highway, mm -hmm. actually goes through Herbera Terus. Okay. So Can you I, trace I, any of the Roman road? You will see, you know, uh, Jabal Hamida, as I said, is kind of arid and remote area. It's yeah. very few in Jordan mm -hmm. that still kind of uh, keep those ancient roads intact. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about ancient road, it's difficult to trace in other part of the Jordan or Israel, but not the case in Jabal Hamida area. Mm. There are two roads. One is from the Dead Sea to Macarius. You will be surprised how intact it is preserved. You mm. can really walk on the street, on the road, that the King Herod might walk about 2,000 years ago. Mm. And then from uh, Atarus to Jacobine, especially about the one mile in the middle, mm -hmm. the ancient road remains intact. So mm -hmm. you can see the supporting wall, you can see this, uh, you know, the stones that put on the both sides of the street, and mm -hmm. then it actually goes through one major ancient site. Mm -hmm. So it's quite amazing, and then it's kind of an interesting experience that you're walking on the trail <laughs> that 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years yeah, ago, yeah. people walked right, and built. Right, right, right. So I think uh, those kind of uh, you know, things will help us to understand mm -hmm. how the ancient people moved from one place to another. Mm -hmm. And then this kind of uh, King Herod's palace in Macarius, very remote and then you know, deserted area, mm -hmm. how that place was connected with Jerusalem or Jericho, other major you know, the mm -hmm. uh, urban centers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did the road go down to the edge of the Dead Sea so that people came across on a boat, or did it go around the sea? Uh, the road down to the Dead Sea, actually there is a port on Zara mm -hmm. that is excavated. A, a short answer as we're running out of time, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, by sea, they could, um, by boat, they right. could go to the Judean Desert. Mm -hmm. The northern one, they have to traverse the, the gorge and then continue to the Jordan Valley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chung Ho. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible what archaeology can teach us. We hope we've provided something for your mind and for your soul, and look forward to our next edition. Uh, until then, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark.